technical, technical issues. Okay, great. So two seconds. Okay. Okay. So. Okay, great. Technical issues. All right. So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome all tonight to our webinar. We'll, we will be discussing navigating immigration options, the difference between consular processing and adjustment of status. Awesome. So this is actually a part of our monthly webinar series. Um, and we really wanted to focus on how to go about getting your green card. Because technically there's two different ways. You can either get your green card while you're physically in the US, or you can get your green card while you're abroad, which is gonna be consular processing. Awesome. So just to keep you guys posted, we are an immigration law firm. Elise Law Firm is currently located in Miami, yeah. <laughs> so it looks like I'm going to have to cover some of Catalina's <laughs> discussion. You know I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to ask um, Annie to join our video call for today. She's our marketing expert and she's also going. Yeah, sure. No problem. So go ahead and have her join as a panelist and then we'll just keep going from there. Um. And if you want, you can stay on also as a panelist and just share your screen so that you can share the presentation so we can kind of get started. In the meantime, I'll let everyone know a little bit about us and um, who we are, what we do. So like Catalina started saying, we are the Elise Law Firm. We are an immigration firm located in Miami, Florida. The firm has actually been in practice since 2012. So we've been helping immigrants from all over the world for, you know, over a decade now. And we really, really, really enjoy helping someone navigate the U.S. immigration process because it can be quite confusing. Um, me personally, I'm an immigrant. I was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and I immigrated to the United States with my family. So I've personally been to the process. I understand how confusing and upsetting it can be and the importance of having someone to really guide you so that you know what you're doing, where you're going, and how to go about getting there. Um, I went to law school here in Miami, Florida, at University of Miami. I'm barred in the state of Florida. Um, you guys can go on our website. I'm sure, hopefully, you guys have been there already. But I've been published in the Miami Herald, um, as well as the Sun Sentinel and different professional publications. I've also been featured on different news stations, for example, NBC, ABC, um, radio shows, et cetera, from all over. So do we, can you share your screen please so that we can have the PowerPoint? Okay, perfect. So really here, um, what we're focusing on is the immigration goal of actually having the green card right? The goal in the process of the adjustment of status or of the consular processing is to finish the process and to have your lawful permanent resident card in your hand. That process is a two-step process, right? Um, regardless of whether you're doing it while you're physically in the U.S. or whether you're abroad. So that's great. Thank you. So it's gonna be a two-step process. The first process is always gonna be the I-130 petition. And that's something that we're gonna go into um, in the next slide. But just so that you guys understand, 
whether, well, to take a step back, there's different ways of getting the green card. You can have a family member, right, file a petition for you. And that's going to be the I-130 petition. Or you can have um, a business or a work um, associate file a petition on your behalf. That's going to be the I-140. Now, for purposes of today's presentation, it was really our goal to focus on the family petition process just because we've gotten a lot of questions about it in the last um, couple months. So we wanted to make sure that we go into that a lot. So for today's purpose, we're really gonna be focused a lot on just the I-130 process and getting your green card through consular processing or adjustment of status through the I-130. So with the I-130, that's gonna be where you have a US citizen or lawful permanent resident who's gonna file your pe a petition on your behalf. Um, it's in very rare circumstances, you're gonna be able to self petition for a green card. So right now what we're focused on is the second step of the process is, okay, once you have an I-130 approved, how do you go about getting a green card? But just keep in mind, there are very rare circumstances where you can actually ask for your own green card. So I'll mention them briefly today. Um, so for example, if someone is filing an I-526 for an EB-5 um, investor petition, you'd be self-petitioning. If you are someone with extraordinary ability in sciences, art, um, et cetera, you can also self-petition for a green card. If you are a, a VAWA recipient, which is the Victims Victim um, Violence Against Women's Act, and it's not only for women, but it could also be for men, it's for children, it's for parents, et cetera. If you have an approved I-360 as a VAWA recipient because you're, you're an immigrant and you're a victim, then you can technically self-petition as well. And if you're a widower, um, so if you have a US citizen spouse who had petitioned for you, but in the middle of the process or you're to continue on your own, you can change that I-130 into a widower petition. So just keep that in mind. So let's go ahead and focus on the I-130 petition. Can anyone file an I-130 petition for you? The answer is no, right? You really wanna make sure that you have the family relationship necessary for you to qualify to have someone petition, file an I-130 petition on your behalf. So I'm asked very often, can my grandparents file a petition for me directly? The answer is no, they may not. So your grandparents may be able to file a petition for your parent, and if you, if you qualify, you may be a derivative of that application, but a grandparent who's a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident is not able to petition for you. Um, a cousin is not able to petition for you, an aunt or an uncle either, right? Immigration is, or even a, I've been asked, I have a godparent. So in the um, immigrant community, especially in the Caribbean, being someone's godparent is very important to the family. So I get often asked, can I my godparents petition for me? The answer is no, unfortunately they may not. So as a US citizen, a US citizen petitioner, they can file for their spouse. They can file for their unmarried children under the age of 21. They can file for their unmarried sons and daughters over the age of 21. They can um, file for their married sons and daughters of any age, their siblings, or their parents. So what's important here to kind of highlight is first the sibling petition. Currently, US citizens are able to file for their siblings. That means their brother or their sister. But to be honest, we don't know how long that's gonna be the case. Why is that? For the majority of the time, every time that Congress has looked into doing some type of immigration reform, they always target that category, which is, well, let's get rid of this category of sibling and let's take the number of visas available for that category to give it to other, to other, to other groups. That has not been done yet, but just wanna highlight that currently right now, if you are a US citizen and you're contemplating whether you should file for your sibling, I would highly encourage that you do so because unfortunately we never know what's gonna happen in the future. And as you guys are all aware, there's always changes happening with immigration. So even though the sibling petition is one of the petitions that do take the longest amount of time, 
Um, if you currently qualify to file an I-130 petition for a sibling, you should definitely take advantage of it because in a few years, that may not even be a possibility. Now, let's talk about the lawful permanent residence. As a green card holder, you are able to file for family members, not as much as you can if you're a US citizen, but as a lawful permanent resident, you are able to file for your spouse. You are able to file for your unmarried child under the age of 21, as well as your unmarried child above the age of 21. So what's important here to highlight is that as a green card holder, you're not able to file for your child if the child is married which is completely different than that of the US citizen. The US citizen is able to file for any child at any age, whether they're married or not. But a green card holder is limited to filing for unmarried children under the age of 21 and unmarried sons and daughters above the age of 21, but again, unmarried. Before we move to the next step, I really wanna focus in on what's called immediate relatives, okay? So immediate relatives are um, US citizens that are filing for their spouse. They're filing for their children under the age of 21 or they're filing for their parent and the US citizen is above the age of 21. That's So those specific categories, if you are an immediate relative, your process will go a lot quicker, but you're not gonna be able to include derivatives as part of your application. What does that mean? I'm sure a lot of people are aware, listen, hey, my mom, you know, my grandfather filed for my parents and you know, I'm a derivative. I will get my green card through that application because I qualify under my mom because I'm her dependent. That's only gonna be available for preference categories. If you are in a media category, you will not qualify as a derivative, which means if you are a US citizen and you're filing for your spouse, if that spouse has a minor child, that minor child will need their separate petition. Unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to file for your spouse and then the minor child will automatically be under their petition. No, so, so that's the big difference be, um, between being part of the immediate relative category and the preference category. Because if you were in the preference category, for example, if you're a lawful permanent resident and you're filing for your spouse, their minor children under the age of 21 would be able to also qualify as a derivative um, beneficiary under that principal beneficiary. So just keep that in mind, okay? So for you to qualify for a green card, not only do you need to have an approved I-130, but that I-130 has to be current. Now, a lot of people will say, what does that mean your I-130 has to be current? Next slide, please. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard, I'm in line to get my visa. I'm waiting for immigration to get to my case. Um, my, this is what you need, this is what everyone's referring to. They're referring to the priority date. And what I've put here on the screen for everyone is a screenshot of an I-130 approval that we recently got at the office. And I circled the priority date. This priority date is actually your place in line, depending on the category that you're in. So just a quick side reference, this is an I-130 petition that was filed um, for a spouse. And as you guys can see, the petition was received in February of 2023 and it was approved in August of 2023. So this client, um, once the application was filed, they were able to get their green card through adjust, and it just so happens through adjustment of status in six months, which is great. And we'll go a little bit further into why that is, why are things speeding up right now for adjustment of status compared to how it was before, okay? Hi, Patricia. <laughs> is there- Hi, 
<laughs> is there any possibility to speed up that priority date? That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, no, there's no way to actually speed up that priority date because the priority date is your place in line where you have to wait for immigration to get to your priority date. And that's what it means for your priority date to be current. So we'll, we'll actually, um, I'll explain that a little bit more in the next slide. How do you know whether your priority date is current or not? There's actually two different ways. The first is if you're physically in the US and you're trying to figure out, do I qualify for adjustment of status? Is it time for me to file for my green card? Is my priority date current? So that's gonna be the chart on the right-hand side. I literally went and took a screenshot of the date of filing for family-sponsored adjustment of status on the USCIS website. Every single month, USCIS will give a report that says, if we got to your priority date and it's on this chart, we will now be accepting your green card application. So as you guys see, for example, for unmarried sons and daughters of US citizens, if you are an unmarried son and daughter, which means you're a part of the F1 category, right? And your priority date is September 1st, 2017 or prior, if you're on the USCIS part, if you're physically here and you qualify for adjustment of status, your priority date has to be prior to September 1st of 2017 for your priority date to be considered current. So how about other categories? Um, if you are a spouse of an LPR, which is the F2A, if you're a spouse of an LPR, or if you're a minor child of a lawful permanent resident, your priority date has to be basically a month or has to be September of 2023. So those categories currently are going quite quickly for adjustment of status purposes. How about siblings? If you have an I-130 petition, with the priority date of March 1st, 2008 or before, and you have everything else you need to adjust your status, your priority date has to be prior to March 1st, 2008. We'll get into this a little bit later in the presentation, but there are circumstances where you may or may not qualify to adjust your status, okay? Now, what happens if you're physically outside of the US or you don't qualify for adjustment of status, which means that you have to get your green card through consular processing, which means you have to get it through the consulate. So go back to the previous slide. Okay, great. So this is gonna be the chart on the left-hand side. Now, as you guys see, I put State Department. So the State Department is the federal agency that's in charge of green cards when you're physically outside the US. When you're physically inside of the US, it's the USCIS, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. They're the ones who get the I-130 petition. They're the ones who review it. They're the ones who approve it. Um, if you qualify for adjustment of status, they will also take that application and adjudicate it. But if you don't qualify for adjustment of status or if you are doing consular processing because you're abroad, US, USCIS will take your approved I-130 and they will send it to another agency, another federal agency, which is the State Department. The State Department is now gonna be supervising. So under their umbrella, you will find the National Visa Center, and you'll also find the US embassies and consulates abroad when it comes to adjudicating this application. Adjudicating means um, reviewing the application and making deci a decision on it. So they're gonna be processing. They're gonna be processing the application. So USCIS processes applications where you're physically in the US. The State Department processes or adjudicates application when you're physically abroad. So if you are out of the US and you would like to know, is my priority date current? Have they gotten to my case? So we get this question a lot. Um, Attorney Elise, my 
mother applied for me five years ago and I have no idea what's going on with my file. Um, can you tell me what's going on? Is something wrong? The first thing that we always do is we ask the clients, the potential clients, please send us a copy of your I-130 receipt. Once we have that I-130, we'll show the client, okay, this is what your priority date is. If the client is doing cost for processing, we'll go to the State Department website, we'll verify the preference categories in the current, in the current um, priority dates, whether they're current or not. And again, every single month, both USCIS and the State Department issues an update what cases they're working on now. So every month you should be checking either the State Department if you're abroad or qualify only for concert processing and USCIS if you think you're eligible for adjustment of status. Why is it important to check every single month? Because unfortunately a USCIS can be and the Department of Homeland Security or, or immigration, sometimes they take some drastic changes. So you can see first, for example, the priority date can stay the same every month. And then one month to the next, there's a huge jump of six months, a year. Or in a very rare circumstance, but we've seen it recently, it retrogresses, which means it goes backwards. So it's really important that every month you check your priority date and you'll have a better idea, okay, of where they are, where you are, and how long it may or may not take moving forward. Okay, next slide, please. Patricia, I have another question. Um, sure. and does this, the, the, this is mean that priority days are faster from inside the US than outside? So it, it depends. Um, so what we've seen currently, because there's been a lot of changes in some of the categories, when you're physically in the US, it'll become current a lot faster. But again, it's important that you also have to qualify to adjust status. Having the priority date by itself and you're physically in the US is not enough to qualify for to adjust status. And we'll talk about that later on in the, in the presentation, but it is a great observation. The priority date while you're physically in the US and the priority date when you're outside, oftentimes are very different which is why it's important that you check both charts just to see exactly where you're at, okay? So now that we have a general idea of what are the differences between consular processing and adjustment of status, let's kind of dive into the consular processing a little bit more. So consular means consulate, right? So consular processing is when you have your um, visa being issued abroad. The first step again is we have that approved I-130 and you have a current priority date. So we understand that, check. When that happens, the I-130, your file is sent to the National Visa Center. The National Visa Center is the, is the office that collects all of the information from immigration, from the petitioner, from the immigrant, puts a file together, okay? and sends the file to the US embassy that's gonna be processing your application. So first at the National Visa Center, you'll have to pay the affidavit of support fee, which is 125. You'll have to pay the DS-260 fee, which is 325. And you also have to upload documents. You'll have to upload civil documents, meaning your updated passports, your birth certificates and the translations, the affidavit of support. Um, what's also important for the National Visa Center is they'll ask you to upload the police certificates for all of the different jurisdictions where you have resided in the past. Now, this specific requirement can be a little tedious because if you've lived in different countries, if you lived in three or four different countries in your life, you will have to go out of your way and figure out how can you get a police certificate from all of these different countries to upload before you're able to actually have your case be ready to be sent to the in-person appointment at the US Embassy. When you upload all your documents to the National Visa Center, you'll notice that they'll, they'll tell you, yes, we'll accept this application. No, this application is incorrect. Yes, we'll accept this document. No, this document is the wrong version. 
The reason that I specify version is every country has different legal documents. So for example, um, in Honduras, there may be different kinds of birth certificates. So the National Visa Center for immigration purposes will only accept one specific ones. For example, in Haiti, we have the birth certificates and we also have the expedition, which is the extract. And for immigration purposes, they want the updated extracts and the translation. So the National Visa Center will guide you as to not only what documents you need to provide, but also which are the correct version of the documents that you'll have to provide to USCIS. You'll also complete the DF-260, which is a uh, form just stating out your address history, your family relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Once everything is complete with the National Visa Center, then you'll get a notice that says, we have sent your application to the US Embassy where you reside or where you're from. Let me, let me take a second to kind of explain why I said that. So you may, you may have been born in a country, but you don't necessarily live there anymore. Um, you may have a choice as to where you send your packet. So it's very often, for example, that we have clients, they don't live in the country where they're from, so we're able to send the packet somewhere else. So that's called being a third party, third country national. And that's also something to consider when you're filling out your application. So once the National Visa Center is done with your packet and you get that green light, thank you very much. You've paid all your fees. We've collected all the information that we need from you. Now the next step is the in-person interview. I cannot stress this enough. Every single US consulate has their own separate instructions. And they often update those instructions. It's extremely important that you take the time to print the instructions, go through the website, review everything so that you are prepared for your in-person interview. Because if you go to that in-person interview and you don't have all the documents that is required for that specific consulate, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a lot of delays. Um, it's hard sometimes to follow up with the consulate. They may ask you for something that you missed. There's specific doctors you have to go to to get your medical exam done or to get your local background check done. So you, you have to be very, very careful. What we do is once we get the interview notice, we'll actually not only read the notice itself, we'll also review the instructions online and then we'll prep our clients to go to the, to the in-person appointment. Once you're at the in-person appointment with your valid passport um, and, let, and everything goes well, you'll have a visa that's actually issued on the actual passport. Congratulations, your, um, your concert processing has been approved. They're gonna put a visa on your passport. Typically it's about two or three months they'll give you. I've seen it be as short as two weeks, but that was in a specific situation. But typically they're about two to three months for visa for you to get on the plane and actually come to the US. When you come to the US, you'll also um, have to pay an immigrant fee. That immigrant fee is $220. And that fee is for now USCIS, right? See how the immigrant is now coming to the US. So they're saying bye to the National Visa Center. They're not under the State Department anymore. They have to send the fee to USCIS. So USCIS in the United States can print the actual green card and mail it to your house, okay? So those are the different steps and on a glimpse, how consular processing works. And let's contrast that to AOS, AOS being adjustment of status. Adjustment of status means that you are physically in the United States on a temporary status. You're a student, you, are, you have a work visa, you have um, a tourist visa, and you would like to change your status, you'd like to adjust that status from the temporary status that you have now to a permanent status, to a lawful permanent resident. The first thing is adjustment of status is not gonna be available to everyone, right? So for example, if you entered the country unlawfully 
or if you have a deportation order or a removal history, or you have a criminal past or convictions, you may not be eligible to adjust status. These can be very space, um, case specific. So it's really important that you sit down and have an attorney review your file so that you can be sure that you actually qualify for adjustment of status. What's great about doing adjustment of status is even though a green card process is always gonna be a two-step process, right? Which is the I-130 and then the request for the green card. But with it, if you qualify for adjustment of status, you may do everything together. You may be able to file both the I-130 and the 485, which is the application for the green card concurrently, which means that you will get things going a little quicker. Um, and this is a great time for me to kind of specify that in 2023, we've definitely seen cases that are being filed this calendar year are going a lot faster than cases that were filed two years ago or last year ago, or last year. Why is that? Is because this current administration has done a lot of changes that, um, that makes it so these applications are approved a lot faster. So for example, the Biden administration now is waiving in-person appointments, which is great. So if you apply for adjustment of status either through marriage or through um, a family, another family petition, maybe you know you are an adult and you have your adult child above the age of 21 who filed for you, you don't necessarily have to go in person to sit down to have an officer review your file. So we always aim to have the interview be waived. So the stronger your packet, the clearer all the documents are, the more organized, you know, the, the stronger that you can show immigration, everything is well organized. You have all of your documents, you have your medical, you have all your backgrounds done, you have all of your evidence well presented. There's no question that you qualify for this green card. The person that is reviewing your application is now actually able to waive the in-person interview, which really expedites the file. And something that we've noticed is as soon as you get an RFP, which is a request for evidence, if you get a if you have a pending green card application and immigration is asking you to submit a sealed medical exam, boom, you already know. Like the next thing in the mail is going to be that green card because the officer has made the decision, they don't need to sit down with you. They don't need to waste all that time. So that's going by really quick. And also for um, immigrants that are already in the system. So for example, if you've already done fingerprints for a previous application, for a TPS case, for an asylum case, and you now qualify to adjust status, they can also waive that in-person appointment for that biometrics. So we're no longer in the world where for every little application you do, you have to go in physically to USCIS and ask and, and get your fingerprints done. Once, you're, once your fingerprints are in the system, they're still making you pay <laughs> to have your fingerprints right done, but they're waiving those appointments, which is expediting a lot of cases. So something that we've seen, for example, um, I-90 applications, which are applications to renew your green cards, they're taking maybe six weeks, eight weeks to be approved, which is amazing because before they were taking well, like close to nine months or sometimes over a year. Adjustment of status cases right now, from what we're seeing, sometimes they're taking as little as four months, six months. Um, in the past, oof, they were taking about a year, a year and a half. So all of the changes that they're making is really helping immigrants and so that we can get these applications um, adjudicated or processed quickly. Unfortunately, applications that were filed a year and a half ago, two years ago, if you're not under the new kind of umbrella program they have going on, those are still taking quite some time. So it's take, you know, you still have to do a lot of follow-ups and et cetera. So just to make sure, um, um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. 
uh, what, what if someone has been deported for over 10 years? Will, will they be able to return with an adjustment of status? So um, that's a great question. They're not, if, if you were physically deported and you're still outside of the United States, you're not gonna qualify for adjustment of status, right? You're gonna have to do consular processing. So yes, there is a possibility for you to return to the US with a green card. And depending the reason why you were deported in the first place, you may or may not need a waiver. So if you're in a situation where you need a waiver or pardon, then that waiver needs to be approved before you're able to come back to the US. But that's something that's a little bit outside the scope of this presentation. Um, something I wanted to point out about the adjustment of status process is we spoke about the filing fees for consular processing, right? So we spoke about um, the 325 fee, the 220, et cetera, that you're paying on the National Visa Center website, the fee for the DS-260. The filing fee for adjustment of status is a lot more than the filing fee for consular processing. The current filing fee for the 45 is 1,125. And that includes applying for your social security number. It includes applying for an employment authorization card while the application is pending, as well as a travel document. The reason I say currently is again, immigration has made the statement that they plan on increasing the filing fees quite significantly. They haven't implemented that. Um, they haven't really told us when that may or may not take place, but that is a question that is a possibility that we're gonna be seeing in the next few months is that USCIS definitely wants to increase the fees. So right now, adjustment of status is 1,125 and that includes the social, the employment authorization and the travel document, but USCIS has made the announcement they want to increase and they also um, want to have you pay a separate fee if you want the employment card and the travel document. So just to keep an eye out for that. Another question, um, Patricia, how do I know if I, quali if I qualify for adjustment of status? So that's great. For you to qualify for adjustment of status, you wanna make sure that you have evidence that you were admitted into the US lawfully, you're paroled into the US, um, that you don't have any unlawful presence if you're not an immediate relative, that you don't have any bars if you have any, um, if you've ever been arrested. And the reason I say arrested is because sometimes you're arrested and you don't think that that arrest is gonna have an, an impact on your immigration case, but it does. Because even though you are not convicted under criminal law, immigration can say, okay, you were arrested and you were fined. So therefore under immigration law, there's a conviction. Um, so what I suggest is if you think that you may or may not qualify, if you wanna make sure that you qualify for adjustment of status, you wanna sit down and have and have us review your case, you know, this is something that we do all the time. Um, we have our phone number and our email below in the screen. You know, our phone number is 305-371-8846. Or you could go online and send us a message where you'll have the opportunity to send us all of the documents that you have. You will have a one-on-one -on -one with myself. Um, Catalina will also be there, another member of our acquisition team. And we could dive into, okay, what's happened in the past? What, like, where are you legally? Um, and what are the possibilities for you to either adjust your status or for you to do concert processing? And it's important that you try to keep on top of, I know it's hard to say, but immigration law is changing constantly. Um, I've had situations where a client was not eligible to adjust status maybe two, three years ago, but they are now because there's been a significant change in policies, right? And this is very much so the case for our TPS recipients. So if you have temporary protective status and you filed for adjustment of status in the past and it was denied, it's very likely that you may be eligible to adjust status now. And it's very important for people to understand every case is different. So if your cousin's mother's neighbor got their green card one way, doesn't mean that you're also gonna qualify the same way. The reason I say that is because some people with TPS 
may need to reopen a deportation case. Some may not. It really depends on what's in the what's in your immigration file. Um, and I'll take the opportunity to kind of plug this in. If you do not have a copy of your immigration records, that's okay. It's important that you have it, but it's okay because we're able to help you file a request so that you can get a copy of your full immigration documents, all of them from USCIS, the State Department, CBP, et cetera. We are able to do a Freedom of Information Act request, often known as a FOIA, so that we can receive a copy of all of your files. Um, I can think of two cases right now where the clients came to me and said, um, doctora or metla, um, or attorney, you know, I filed my, my application before. I don't have all my documents. I don't understand why I was denied. What's going on? We filed to get a full copy of their records. Sometimes we'll get 200 documents back. Sometimes we'll get close to 2000, right? Um, regardless of the amount of documents we get back, we sit down. I will literally review every single page, do an outline and explain to the client legally, this is what happened in the past. This is where you are right now. These are your options moving forward. Um, so in Korea, it would be like, we would say, we would figure out how to debloquer, how to, um, to see if there's a place in your file where it's stuck, how to to get it moving again and to fix the issue if we're able to. And that's also something that we pride ourselves in. We will definitely let you know if there's a possibility or not, because if there is no possibility, then we'll be very clear. Listen, from our experience, this isn't the time to file. Um, let's wait to see maybe if there's any changes in policy that you can benefit from, right? But right now may not be the time for you because as the policy stands, you're not gonna be able to benefit or we're not gonna be able to get you to the immigration goals the way that you'd like, okay? So let's go to the next slide. Okay, great. Now, which option is the best option for me? Um, should you file for adjustment of status or should you do consular processing? For adjustment of status, one of the benefits is that you are able to physically be in the US. But for some people, that is not what they want, right? Because remember, for adjustment of status, you're sending your application to USCIS and you're waiting here until you get your green card or until you get that travel document. And even when you get that travel document, some immigrants are not comfortable flying with the travel document because it says on the paper, reentry is not guaranteed. So at the end of the day, adjustment of status cases you're limiting your international traveling. And some people must travel. So I'm talking about the immigrants that are the breadwinners. I'm talking about the immigrants where they have businesses abroad and they have to be able to travel back and forth from the US to their home country until that green card is approved. If you must travel and you're not able to come to the US, wait, file your green card, stay physically here until that green card is approved or you get that travel document, which by the way, can take months, then adjustment of status is not for you, right? Adjustment of status is also more expensive. So we spoke, we went through the different filing fees. The fee that you're paying immigration is more for adjustment of status than it is for consular processing. Um, for adjustment of status, you must qualify to adjust status. So there are circumstances where someone may think they qualify. So um, for example, today I'll speak to a family. He had an approved I-130 from his sibling. He thought he qualified to adjust status. He filed his application, it was denied because unfortunately he had unlawful presence and um, he just didn't qualify to adjust status. So Figuring out whether you qualify for adjustment status first is really, really imperative. And sometimes it can be a little tricky. For adjustment of status, if there's an interview for your adjustment of status case, an attorney may attend the interview with you. So what we do is we always give the client a choice. Um, we're always gonna prep you. We'll do either an in-person pre um, prep meeting or a video call. 
where we'll go through all of your applications with you. We'll also do a mock interview. This is what to expect from the immigration officer, et cetera. And we can also accompany you and be there physically in the room with you when you do adjustment of status. However, for consular processing, even though, right, you are able to travel back and forth because you're gonna get your appointment abroad, um, there are some downsides. So for consular processing, you have to make sure you get all of the police certificates. Sometimes they're not available. Sometimes you have to fly to the foreign country to get it. Um, so that can be a little bit frustrating. For adjustment of status, we don't have that because you do your fingerprint appointments and immigration um, coupled with the FBI will do the background check. For consular processing also, you're at the mercy of the consulate. So there are some consulates like Port-au-Prince, Haiti are closed. Um, there are a lot of consulates also because of COVID are still very much so behind, you know? So with consular processing, you're at the mercy of the consulate, which is something to consider. Um, and lastly, for consular processing, you are not able to go with an attorney because for consular processing, that's the State Department and the G28 um, and the notice you have an attorney on file is only gonna be valid for USCIS. So mm -hmm. you're not able to actually be accompanied by an attorney to that in-person appointment. What happens if you change your mind? Can you change your mind? Yes, you can definitely change your mind about how to go about doing your application. So let's say, for example, at the very beginning of, the, of your immigration journey, you were either physically outside the US or you knew from you knew that you didn't qualify for just for adjustment of status. So you filed the I-130 saying, I would like my file to be sent to Paris because that's where I'm currently residing. Great. Now, during the application process, you're like, you know something, I would rather you know, I'm visiting my family member who's filed for me. Um, I'm visiting my spouse. I'm visiting my adult child. I think I'd rather stay in the U.S. and remain in the U.S. until I get my green card. Are you able to do that? Absolutely. Yes, you can. You know, you want to make sure, obviously, that you don't come in knowing you're going to do this or you don't come in to the U.S. with a one-way ticket and you're like, well, I'm going to come in on vacation and then two days later, apply for adjustment of status. That's not gonna work, right? You wanna make sure that you're coming in with the intent on your tourist visa that you're gonna go back home. But after a few weeks or a few months, um, immigration says usually after three months, um, they can understand that you've changed your mind and you would like to remain in the US if you qualify for adjustment of status. Can you do this? Absolutely. Um, do you have to file anything else? Yes, what you have to file is the 45 and all the accompanying um, documentation so that your consular processing case can now be changed to adjustment the status. Well, what happens if, you know, your I-130 is approved and is sent to the National Visa Center? You just have to let the National Visa Center know, listen, I'm here in the US, I qualified to AOS and that's what I'm doing. Um, is it possible to do it the other way around? Well, it is, it doesn't happen quite often, right? Where you start off the case doing adjustment of status and then you change your mind and you want the case to be sent abroad. Um, that is possible. It's a little bit more complicated. At that point, you would have to actually file an actual application, pay the filing fee, requesting now that USCIS send the file to the National Visa Center to get it ready for um, consular processing. Now, I, I would like to take the opportunity to, to, I know we had questions about parole. In the, again, US immigration policies, procedures, laws are constantly changing. Um, this year, 2023, we started the year with the Biden parole, right? This is the humanitarian parole program where you are able um, to come into the US if you qualify through that, through that um, program. You have to be a national of, of Haiti, Cuba, Nicaragua, and, um, 
in some other countries for the Biden program, humanitarian parole. So can you come to the US on a humanitarian parole program, even though you have a pending I-130 or you have an approved I-130? The answer is absolutely yes. In fact, they encourage you to do that. USCIS and immigration encourages you to take advantage of the parole program. Um, don't forget the humanitarian parole program was created for Venezuela, for Cuba, for Haiti, for um, Nicaragua, because immigration has um, taken the position, they know that nationals of those countries are taking desperate measures to come to the US and very much, and a lot of times illegally. And if you have a pending I-130 that you're able to qualify for your green card, but for the fact that you're not able to get an appointment at the consulate or it's taking too long or et cetera, et cetera, by all means, they do want you to take advantage of the parole program. Now, once you come as an immigrant, once you enter the US on the humanitarian parole, that is the time to say, okay, let me sit down with my attorney and figure out when I can apply to adjust my status. Is my priority date current? Is there anything in my um, immigration history? Is there any other issues that I'm not able to file for right now? But at our firm, we've definitely helped um, a good number of people um, file for their green cards after they entered the US on the humanitarian parole program. So if you guys um, have any questions or want to reach out to us personally, I know that um, we had mentioned the phone number and, and the website, but I don't, the website is www.elizelawfirm.com. That's E-L-I-Z-E-E. -E. Um, if you want to get in contact with us, you're able to send us an inquiry at the elizelawfirm.com. And from there, you'll be able to communicate with our acquisition team and have that one-on-one -on -one call. Okay, so those are, you know, just a few, um, a few points on the humanitarian parole. Now, you, can you go back to the, the last screen just one more time? Okay, great. So another point is not only do we have the Biden parole program now, but we also have the family reunification parole programs that also started this year, which is again for, um, for Haiti, for Honduras, for Colombia, for Guatemala. So how is the family unification parole program changing this process? Like what's going on here? Well, what's happening is it's taking a consular processing case and it's turning it into an adjustment of status case by allowing the immigrant to come to the US before their priority is current. That is what the program is doing. So remember how I said, listen, if you're out of the country, if you're doing consular processing, you have to go to the State Department's website and to keep an eye to make sure that they haven't passed your priority date. As soon as your priority date is current, you should be expecting some kind of communication from the State Department, especially the National Visa Center, saying that, listen, it's time now to get your case ready to be sent to the consulate. These family reunification parole programs are changing the game. So what they're doing is they're saying, listen, you still have two, three years about before we even get to your file, but we're gonna let you come in now um, so in certain circumstances, you'll see that the I-130, you've already even paid the fees online, but, or, um, it's a, it's a little tricky right now. They're just starting with the program. <laughs> um, but in these circumstances, you'll see that they're letting you come in before they get to your priority date. And when they do that, they let you come in with parole. They let you come in with a temporary status. And the idea is for you to come in with your parole, which means you're not going to the US consulate to get your interview. 
you're not coming in to the U.S. and automatically getting your green card. You're coming into the U.S. on a parolee status, and the idea is for your priority date to become current before your parole status expires. That is the idea behind the program, which is great because the, the positive side of the program is you're able to come to the U.S. a little quicker and be reunited with your family. The downside is it puts a lot of responsibility on the immigrant. Why is that? It's because there's been circumstances in the past where you come into the program, you come into the US on the Haitian Family Unification Parole Program, right? And from that program, your I-94 has a certain time that is gonna expire. Your I-94 is your permis de séjour or the amount of time that you're able to stay in the US. If your priority date does not become current before your parole status ends, it's your responsibility as an immigrant to apply to re-parole, right? To re-parole. And if you do not do that, then you may lose out on the opportunity to adjust status because if you do not re-parole, that's when you start accumulating unlawful presence into the US. So these programs, the, the family unification and parole programs, they do seem very easy and et cetera, but there's some serious immigration consequences if you are not aware of the details of how the program works, why they started the program, um, and also what to do when you enter the US through these programs. So just keep that in mind as well, okay? All right. We have a question here, Patricia. What if I, I have not filed for an I-130? Can I just apply for the parole program? So again, there's, there's different programs. There's two parole programs right now, right? There's two different parole programs. There's the humanitarian Biden parole program. A lot of people just call it the Biden program. And there's the family unification parole program. For the Biden parole, it doesn't matter whether you have an I-130 pending or not. Anyone can come in if they're a national and of the countries that qualify for the Biden program. So you can come in through the Biden program and if your I-130 is current or you're an immediate relative, then you can turn around and file for adjustment of status. That's fine. Now, if you're coming in through the Family Unification and Parole Program, it's extremely important that you have an I-130 that is approved. In fact, you're not gonna be able to participate in the Family Unification and Parole Program um, on your own. The National Visa Center has to invite the petitioner to take part of the program. So it's not just anyone that can say, hey, I wanna take part of this program. No, they have to invite the petitioner and say, listen, you have this pending I-130 that's sitting there. Do you want to leave it sitting so that it goes through the regular consular processing? Or do you want to request that your family member comes to the US before that priority date is current? Next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have another question here. Um, I'm a I'm a U.S. citizen, and I filed for my wife who's in Haiti. She's waiting for an interview. Am I eligible for Haiti Haitian Family Reunification Program? So that's a great question. If you're a U.S. citizen and you filed for your spouse, that means that you're an immediate relative. And if you're an immediate relative, there's no waiting in line. So unfortunately, you're not going to qualify for family unification because that's not what the program is meant for. The program is meant for these preference categories that are waiting years and years and years before they get to start the National Visa Center process. So if you're an immediate relative, you are not able to take part of the Haitian Family Unification Parole Program. However, you can file under the regular Biden program to have their spouse enter the US on regular parole. And when she's here, then do adjustment of status for them. Um, another, so something I would also advise is um, you may also want to look at third 
country um, consulates if appropriate. So for example, if your spouse has a visa to another country, then reaching out to the US embassy in that other country and hopefully that country will agree to take on the case. Um, you know, we, we do have a lot of clients in Haiti and because of the situation at the consulate, you know, we've been able to, on their behalf, reach out to the National Visa Center, um, show them that, listen, the immigrant is, um, has a valid visa to go to the Bahamas, to go to the DR, to go to France, and they have access to another country, we will allow the case to be taken from the Haiti pile, put in those other countries so that they can have a faster processing of their case. So that's also a possibility to look into. Okay. I have another question. Thank you. Uh, if our file is in process and we enter to the U.S. on parole, can we travel back and forth to Haiti until we, until we receive the green card? Absolutely not, right? Because don't forget, if you enter through parole, parole is not a visa. Um, I've had this question a lot. Parole is not a visa. The only, the only way you're able to travel back and forth between the US and your home country is if you have a visa on your passport. That visa needs to be issued by the US consulate. The consulate is not involved at all in this parole process. So when you enter the US on a humanitarian parole program, you're gonna be eligible to stay legally in the country until your I-94 expires. Um, is there a possibility for you now to apply for a travel document asking for permission to travel? Yes. But it's not necessarily, you know, sometimes it takes time. You have to give enough documentation to show that the travel document is required and you need it. But it's not like having a visa at all. Um, these humanitarian programs are designed to allow the immigrant to leave their, their desperate situation, their home country, to come to the United States and to be here, not to be traveling back and forth. This is not a visa program. I um, just want to make sure that I make it clear. So I know that we've held you guys now for close to an hour. Um, I just want to make sure that, you know, you guys are learning um, and we're answering your questions and you kind of hear a little bit from us, what we do. Um, like I said at the beginning, we are an immigration firm. Our physical office is located in Miami, Florida, but we do help immigrants from all over. We have a good number of people that we speak to in South America, in Europe, um, the Caribbean, obviously, as well. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. As long as you have access to the internet, we can definitely help you and we'll be able and we'll be our, it will be our pleasure to really guide you with the process. Um, what we kind of bring to your experience um, with USCIS is guiding you, right? Immigration is always changing how they're doing things or policies. So we can tell you, listen, from our experience right now, this is what's happening. Um, our office is also able to do follow-ups. We actually have um, team members that is their, that is their job is to help our current clients follow up with pending cases. So if you feel like, hey, this case is taking too long, I wanna know what's going on, you know, we will definitely do the follow-ups with you. We can get you involved with the follow-ups. We'll actually call USCIS with you so that you can hear it from, you know, the horse's mouth what's going on so that you feel a little bit reassured. Um, and again, I know I mentioned the importance of doing strong packages because we've been doing this for quite some time. We know what's required in a package for it to be approved and also to hopefully get that in-person interview waived, which brings you finally to peace of mind. Next slide, please. Okay, so I hope that you guys enjoyed this webinar. Um, we, it is really our goal to have the webinar be done once a month. Our next webinar will, I would love to do our, our next webinar on the family unification parole programs. You know, the, these are new programs that are being um, introduced to the immigrant, to the immigrant community. A lot of people have a lot of questions, a lot of rumors going around. Um, so my goal is to have our next webinar, hopefully in the next, 
usually we do it once a month, but this is such a pressing um, topic. We'll try to see if we can bump it up a little bit, maybe in the next two weeks or so. If we can have another one really diving into the family reunification parole program. Um, so for example, who qualifies for it? What happens if the petitioner dies, um, which is a big issue? What happens if I get remarried? What if I was divorced? What if I don't have the documents? Um, what if I had a new baby in the meantime? You know, um, what happens if there are some criminal issues? What happens if I have more than one application pending? You know, one applicant, one application got the request for the family application parole, the other one didn't. What if I have a pending um, Biden program? Can I still do this? What if my passport is at the US embassy abroad? What's gonna happen? So there's been a lot of questions, a lot of confusion. So it will definitely be a pleasure for us to really focus on the family unification parole programs and how, first, what is the program about? Why did they start it? How is it working? What are the steps? You know, what to keep an eye out for? Um, so if you guys are interested, you know, make sure to let us know. Um, make sure to sign up for our newsletter on our website as well, you know, elysialawfirm.com. If you guys want a consultation with our team, with myself and my team, please make sure to give us a call at 305-371-8846. And you can always go on our website where we try to update everyone. We have a blog that's pretty active. We try to update the blog at least twice a month with updates of what's going on with USCIS and immigration. And that's a great way to kind of just see, okay, what are we doing also in the firm? What's happening? We're also on social media. I hope you guys are enjoying the videos that we're doing, kind of educating everyone as to what's been going on. Um, I wanna take the opportunity to thank everyone for being here with us. It's our pleasure to kind of bring this for you. Any suggestions on topics, we would love to hear them. So drop us a line, drop us a comment. And we are here to really help you you know, through the immigration process. Like we know how difficult it can be and how frustrating. And this is why we do it, you know, to get someone from a difficult place to being um, stable and at peace and happy and, you know, a place where they can change their lives and their families' lives. So I hope everyone enjoyed. Thank you so much. Thank everybody. you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Carolina. Um, and remember that uh, for this webinar, attendings will receive a complimentary consultation to review your cases. And you can reach out uh, intro at leclawfirm.com or give us a call at 305-371-8846. Or, and you can speak to our member of our acquisition team for next step. Thank you so much again for your time, Catalina and Patricia. Have a Thank great you. night today. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much. Bye-bye.